And we are speaking on one of those exciting topics that Laura mentioned earlier, which is a domestic asset protection trust statute that was just passed in Connecticut. I'm Meg DeLuca, and I'm speaking with Laura Beck. I'm a partner in the Stanford office, and as Laura probably already said during her introduction, uh, she is a partner in our Greenwich office and the head of the private clients group throughout uh, Stanford, and, I mean, Connecticut and Florida for Cummings and Lockwood. The Asset Protection Trust is a new idea in asset protection planning. It's new to Connecticut. It's not new to the, uh, to the universe of asset protection, but it's the first time we've had the ability to do it in Connecticut. We've always had the ability to do some type of asset protection planning for our clients. The asset protection is basically a structure where you segregate a client's assets from their liabilities to try to protect those assets from any type of claims of creditors. In the past in Connecticut, we've basically used three different techniques for removing the assets from the liabilities. The basic one and what everybody does, each of you who drove here today has done this, is purchase insurance. Car insurance, liability insurance for homeowners, umbrella policies, that's your first defense against any type of creditor's claims. The second defense is to create some type of barrier between the liabilities and the client's assets. And one way we also do that is by creating entities, such as an LLC, and putting assets in that entity that might create a liability for the client. For instance, a rental property would be a perfect asset to put in an LLC. That way, if you have a slip and fall or some other instance on that property, your other assets are not available to the creditor. They can only sue against the property owned by the LLC. There are also certain assets in Connecticut that are just exempt from creditor's claims. So for those of you who administer IRAs and 401ks, those assets have special status under Connecticut law and creditors can't access those. So encouraging your clients to take advantage of those and fund those to the fullest extent is a good idea. We also use LLCs in this context where we sometimes have clients put assets in an LLC because that protects the assets from creditors outside the LLC. If they want to get to LLC assets, they first have to bring a case against the client and then what they get from that LLC is not the underlying assets of the LLC, but some type of charging order against the LLC or an assignee interest in the LLC, which is not the same as owning the underlying assets. So we can discourage the creditors from bringing claims because they know they're not really gonna get anything if assets are owned in an LLC. And finally, we sometimes encourage our clients to give away their assets. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. But we've always done this. We've always said to clients, you know, you can transfer your, your house to your spouse, Dr. So-and-so, so that if you get sued, you won't, your house won't be taken by your patients. Um, that's been a very common way of doing things. In many instances, we do that outright. But we've also done asset protection planning for our clients and their children and their spouses by setting up trusts for their benefit. And I'm sure you've seen these trusts before, creditor protected trusts. When we do this, we set up a trust either during the lifetime of our client or at their death. We put the assets in the trust. We put an independent party as trustee of the trust, someone who is not related to or subordinate to the grantor of the trust or the beneficiaries. And we give that independent trustee total and absolute discretion over when to make distributions from that trust to the beneficiary. Because the trustee has total discretion to make about when to make distributions, the beneficiary cannot force the trustee to make distributions to the beneficiary. And if they can't force the trustee to do so, neither can their creditors force the trustee to do so. So we do not put in those trusts what's called a HEM standard, Jesse talked about it, a health, education, maintenance, and support standard, because except under the new UTC laws, right, Laura? They now, that can serve as a block to creditors, but to, in, historically that was not a block, and if you could get to those assets, so could your creditors. But when we set those up, we typically wanted to have a very flexible trustee in there because we might not like what they're doing. So we wanna be able to remove and replace them. Those were all the tools we had at our tool shed at the time until just recently. 
we were not able to come up with a way that our clients could have asset protection and also maintain access to their assets. So Laura's gonna talk to you about the new asset protection trust where our clients can have their cake and eat it too. Thanks, Meg. So can you really have your cake and eat it too if you want this kind of asset protection? Typically, there were a number of barriers to this. First of all, at a common law, you couldn't create a trust for yourself, fund it with your own assets, and have it even be recognized. A so-called self-settled trust just didn't exist under common law. So you couldn't set up a trust for yourself to begin with. As some jurisdictions changed that law and allowed it, they didn't necessarily allow for those trusts that they now could be created to actually have creditor protection. So there was a time when you could set up a trust for the benefit of yourself and put assets in it, and that was recognized, but it didn't necessarily get you asset protection. So that was the first barrier, was that the structure didn't even exist to do this. But historically, as the, the law has developed, there were non-U.S. jurisdictions that started to allow self-settled trusts and started to give good creditor protection for those trusts, asset protection for those trusts. So you may have heard of, you know, trusts being set up in the Guernsey Island or in Cayman Islands, and you could, in theory, take your assets, bring them offshore, put them in a trust where they would be protected from your creditors. These so-called offshore asset protection trusts, though, weren't always appealing to the average client because they required actually moving your assets to uh, an outside jurisdiction, putting them in the hands of a foreign bank or a trust company, because that's how you got the, the access to those laws, and then the administrative hassles and expenses of maintaining those trusts in a foreign jurisdiction weren't appealing to the average client. U.S. states started to recognize, though, why would we just be letting people do this offshore? Why might we not want to do this in our own jurisdictions? So in the past 10 years or so, a number of U.S. states have developed domestic asset protection trust laws to allow self-settled trusts in their jurisdiction, which have some level of asset protection, creditor protection. Connecticut has just become the 19th state to enact this legislation. We're not always on the forefront. Often we're the 48th state to do something. <laughs> this time we're only 19, it's, it's pretty exciting. So as of January 1st, 2020, these kinds of trusts will be available in Connecticut. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of what the statute actually says about how you create these trusts and what some of their flexibilities and limitations might be. Then I'm gonna turn it back to Meg to talk about a little bit of the way the creditor protection actually works when you set these trusts up. But a Connecticut Domestic Asset Protection Trust, or DAPT, but it requires basically three elements to set up one of these trusts. You need to have a qualified disposition, you need to have a qualified trustee, and this all has to be done under a trust instrument. So what do these three things really mean? I'm gonna take them in reverse order and talk about what is a trust instrument. A trust instrument under this statute needs to be a document which creates an irrevocable trust, which provides that Connecticut law is gonna govern both the validity and the administration of the trust. It has to contain a spendthrift clause that is enforceable under bankruptcy law, and a spendthrift clause is essentially a clause that says nothing in the trust can be assigned or pledged or promised by the beneficiaries to their creditors, so they can't use the trust to say, don't worry, I'll pay you back with assets from the trust. And it needs to appoint a qualified trustee. Okay, so far, easy enough. What's a qualified trustee? Under the statute, there has to be at least one qualified trustee, and a qualified trustee is simply an individual who's a resident of Connecticut, other than the transferor, or a bank or a trust company that has a place of business in Connecticut is authorized to engage in business in Connecticut and which is actually doing business in Connecticut for the trust itself, doing something, whether it's maintaining assets in the, in the state, maintaining books and records in the state, doing administrative work in the state of Connecticut. And not all of the trustees of the trust have to be qualified trustees, but there has to be at least one qualified trustee. The statute actually contemplates what if you set one of these trusts up with a qualified trustee, but your trustee ceases to be a qualified trustee at some point. Say you appoint an individual who's resident in Connecticut, and lo and behold, they decide to move to New York. The statute says that there must always be a qualified trustee. So if your only qualified trustee ceases to 
qualify, it will force a vacancy. It will deem that the trustee has resigned, forcing a vacancy that has to be filled with another qualified trustee. So we've got two of the elements down now. We've got the trust instrument and the qualified trustee. So what's a qualified disposition? Qualified disposition is, is as easy as the other two. It's just a transfer or conveyance of property to the trust with or without consideration by a transferor to a qualified trustee by means of a trust instrument. Not that complicated. Although I will note, one of the bullet points, see it says by a transferor who may be a trustee of another trust. And the reason they put that in there is they recognized we're the 19th state to do this, not the first. Maybe some Connecticut people would have liked to have set this up in Connecticut, but couldn't, and they went to a state like Delaware or South Dakota to create one of these trusts. We want to be able to let them bring them back to Connecticut now. So if you have clients who have set these kinds of trusts up in another state, but would prefer to bring them back to Connecticut, especially if they're using a bank or a trust company in Delaware or South Dakota that they're paying a fee to that they otherwise wouldn't be involved with, and they could easily bring it back to Connecticut and use somebody local here, you can actually bring pre-existing domestic asset protection trusts back to Connecticut. So even though the original trust may not qualify under Connecticut statute, you can set up a new Connecticut trust, have your existing trust decanted into the new Connecticut trust, and they will use the original date of disposition as the tracking period for when the assets became protected from creditors. And that point will make a little bit more sense when Meg talks to you about when you fund a trust and how long it takes before those assets are protected, but they're giving the benefit of the original time that the assets began their protection. They don't start a new protection period by coming back to Connecticut. So far, to my mind at least, this is one of the easiest statutes I've ever had to read and understand. It's pretty simple, three things. You need a trust document, you need a qualified trustee, and you need to make a qualified disposition, which is essentially just transferring assets to that qualified trustee pursuant to the terms of a trust document. Pretty much what we do all day, every day. But there are some caveats. Let's go back to the question about how much you can actually have your cake and eat it too. We know how to bake it now, but how much of it can you eat? Can you eat it as much as you want, whenever you want, or what are the restrictions going to be? How much control can the donor retain over the assets of the trust is really, to my mind, the thrust of the question. Because if you're saying, I'm, I want to keep these assets for myself but protect them for my creditors, how much do you have to give up in order to get the protection, and how much does that feel like you're not really keeping them any longer? So while the assets have to be in a trust that's irrevocable, and the donor cannot be given the right to demand the assets back if he or she changes her mind, the statute allows the transferor to retain certain powers as long as those powers are actually spelled out in the trust agreement. So the trust agreement itself has to specify which powers the donor is retaining. Some of those powers include the right to veto distributions that the trustee might otherwise be making to beneficiaries of the trust, the right to decide and to change who is going to receive the trust assets that remain at the donor's death, the right to receive income from the trust automatically, so you can put assets in and say, from day one, I'm going to get the income back from this trust, even though the rest of the assets are going to stay in the trust and be protected from creditors, the right to receive principal from the trust as needed for those HEM standards that Jesse talked about and that Meg mentioned, the health, education, maintenance, and support, and also the right to receive income and principal from the trust as the trustee determines, the right to receive up to 5% of the principal of the trust every year even if the trustee doesn't agree, the right to replace trustees with other trustees who are independent, meaning not related to or employed by the transferor, and some, some other rights that are delineated in the statute. So there is the ability to maintain a lot of flexibility and the ability to have some guarantee that at least some of the assets can be gotten back if needed. But the donor is really giving up a large part of the control over this on a day-to-day -day basis in exchange for the protections from their creditors. So it's not the kind of trust that you would want to say, I'm going to put everything I own in this trust because I know I can get it all back tomorrow if I need it. There has to be a, a balancing between how much control you want to retain, how much you're willing to give up in exchange for the protection, and how much, as a result, you're willing to put in the trust to begin with. 
Meg's going to talk a little bit about when you do actually fund these trusts, how the creditor protection works, and then she and I will come back and talk a little bit about how you weigh the decision making about what you want to put in it, how much you want to retain, both in terms of your rights and how much you just want to keep as your own assets because it doesn't sound like this trust is going to work for everything you own. I'm going to turn it back to Meg about the creditor protection. Okay, so to, to belabor this point about eating your cake, what if someone else wants to try your cake too? So creditors, nothing new is really all that new in this concept of transferring assets out of your control and, and how creditors can access them. Because these, even though we have this statute that says you can now create this trust that you can be a beneficiary of, things like the Fraudulent Conveyance Act still apply to this, to this trust. So for instance, and, and always applied to any transfers that you made to your spouse or otherwise when you were trying to avoid creditors. If you make a conveyance, it will be considered a fraudulent if it is made after the creditor's claim arose. So whatever the incident is that you're getting sued for, if it arose already, and you're doing this with actual intent to hinder, delay, or defraud the creditor, that's a fraudulent conveyance. And those transfers will not be respected and the creditor can still get to the assets transferred under those circumstances. So number one, if you have someone coming into you, and I just had this this summer, coming into me and say, oh, my wife, I'm not getting along with her so well, I'd like to set this up, and I, and I go, well, you know, if that's the case, when are you getting divorced? Because that brings me to point number two, which is not only might that be a fraudulent conveyance already if there was a divorce sort of brewing, but the, the next thing is there's also a time frame, even if it's not a fraudulent conveyance, there's a time frame during which the creditor can still bring a claim against transferred property even if it was done before the claim arose. So there's a four year period in basically all claims that is the statute of limitations period for a creditor to be able to bring a claim to get to the assets that were transferred to a domestic asset protection trust. That's nothing new also. There's always been this four year period for transfers out. What is, I think also, it is definitely in the Fraudulent Conveyance Act, but if you have an existing creditor and you make the transfer, they get four years or the later of one year uh, after they reasonably could have discovered the transfer. So it's actually a longer period for existing creditors at the time the transfer was made. Certain creditors are also exempt from this statute. Like you can't make these transfers in certain situations. And they really make sense. I mean, they seem like they should be from public policy reasons. They, they shouldn't be exempt. For instance, a spouse or a child with a valid uh, order of support against the client, if it was in existence at the time that the qualifying transfer was made. So in divorce situations and child support situations, someone can't avoid those obligations by creating this kind of trust or making any other transfer. A tort creditor who is in existence at the time of the transfer. A tort, this is the first thing you learn in law school, is called is a civil wrong, and it's basically everything you think about when you think about litigation and someone bringing a civil suit. It's all slips and falls, it's car accidents, it's all that jazz. And if you, so if you have somebody who has a claim in existence and you say, oh my gosh, I know this is happening. I just got in a car accident. I really hurt this guy. He went in the to the hospital in an ambulance. I'm going to set this trust up today. That's not going to work. You're not getting away with that. You cannot make yourself insolvent by setting up this trust because they, you can't avoid your current creditors by just giving away everything that you have. And not surprisingly, you cannot use these trusts for Medicaid planning. You can't give it away and then reduce your assets to that tiny little bit that you, you need to have in order to qualify for Medicaid and still have access to these, these assets in the trust. That's just not permitted. It should be noted though that there are some people who are exempt also from being sued by creditors. You guys, as the planners and us as the attorneys, are not subject to any claims. People involved in counseling, drafting, preparing, executing, or funding a trust that is subject to a qualified disposition. We cannot be sued under this act for those uh, transactions and our involvement in those. But don't forget, the fraudulent conveyance statute is a totally separate statute. And we do have responsibilities under that statute 
for acting in accordance with that statute, not abetting someone to make a fraudulent conveyance. And we do have responsibilities under, for at least lawyers, and I'm sure there are other, there are ethics rules that apply to you folks as well, that say that we can't go ahead and try to defraud creditors by assisting our clients in that manner. So we have to be aware of that when we're making those transfers. There's so much more in this act that tells you all the nitty gritty about how to make a claim and when to make a claim and all that jazz. But we're not gonna get into that today because it's just two nuts and bolts and it's sort of detail oriented. Um, and you'd have to read the statute or talk to a lawyer to do it anyways at the time. So we're gonna skip over that and talk to you about some of the things that we think you should take away for both your clients and yourselves when you walk out. In terms of, you know, if your client comes to you and says, I've heard that now I can do these domestic asset protection trusts, I want to do it. I want to set it up tomorrow. I want to get everything in it that I own so that I know it's all protected, but I can get it all back if I need it. And then I can drive recklessly, give up my insurance. I don't have to worry. doesn't work that way, obviously, but, but how does it work? And what would the conversation, you know, I would envision having with a client who comes in and says that be? First and foremost, it would be how much are you willing to give up control in general? Are you the kind of person who would be comfortable saying, I'm going to put some or a large amount or, you know, a good portion of my assets into a trust where I may have some rights, I may be able to retain some control, but I've given up full control of my assets. You know, you have to be comfortable with that and you have to be comfortable with the trustees that you're going to choose to be the decision makers on your behalf. You also have to be cognizant of what you are trying to avoid in terms of claims. How much protection are you going to get when you put assets in this kind of trust? Because we do have look back rules and we do have fraudulent conveyance issues and you're not going to get out of your current claims and your current debts. So you know, what are you trying to achieve with this and is it a reasonable thing to be doing? And, you know, how much are you going to put into the trust? So those are things to talk to the client about. Also, as a lawyer, at least, I'd be talking to them about the caveats like we always do. You know, is it really going to work? Are we sure that this actually will provide the protection that the statute says it's going to provide? And some of the issues that we still don't know in full because, as you know, as I said, this is a new law for us, but even for the 18 other states who went before us, it's a relatively new concept in the U.S. to have these kinds of trusts, and we haven't seen how they all play out yet with claims made against the trust. But if you have somebody who gets to, who sets one of these up in Connecticut, moves to New York, and gets divorced in New York, and the New York Divorce Court says those assets are on the table, are we positive that they're not going to be on the table in a New York divorce because this is a Connecticut statute? We're not sure. We're not sure how the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution saying that every state has to give full faith and credit to the rulings and laws of other states is going to play out with 19 states that have these kinds of statutes and do the math. 31 mm -hmm. states that do, <laughs> that do not. So, you know, there is always going to be the caveat of, we, even if we do everything right, can we guarantee that this is going to work the way we expect it to? And I'll also say there are asset protection attorneys who think this is a great result, and asset protection attorneys and trust and estates attorneys like me who say, I'm not so sure. There is a couple of cases for, for offshore trusts where the trusts worked exactly like they were supposed to. The trustees refused to turn over the assets, said we can't be compelled to turn over the assets, but the creditors got jailed. So, you know, from the standpoint of did the trust work? Yeah, it worked great. But from the standpoint of the guy in jail, I'm not so sure that would have been the end result they would have hoped for. So, you do have to think about how the actual you know, end result might play out. That said, I don't think there's any downside to clients trying this from that perspective. You're not putting yourself in a worse position having tried to protect the assets unless you start making other decisions on the assumption that you've got an ironclad trust here and it may not be so. But those are, you know, not reasons not to do any of this, just things that your, your client would have to balance in terms of their deciding if this is right for them and to what degree. Meg will talk to you about what you have to think about when you're talking to your clients about whether you want to be involved in one of these for a client. One of the things that's come up with us when we sat down and reviewed this statute as a group was the risks of advising in this area and um, acting as trustee on these trusts, which we often act as trustee on trusts. 
And we think that there's a lot to be concerned about in, if you're going to be advising and also if you decide to act as a trustee. I mean, the first one is the whole fraudulent conveyance thing. When you're trying to assist a client and knowingly, the, the quote is knowingly assist a client to defraud creditors by creating, making them balance sheet insolvent is what a fraudulent conveyance is. It means that on their balance sheet, if you take liabilities and debts, they got zip. So if you're involved in that, what's your risk? First, besides the uh, fact that you're not supposed to be doing that and you can be held liable under the fraudulent conveyance statutes, you also, as I said, have breaches of ethical standards that could subject you to penalty. Even more so, you could be held accountable by the client for if the transaction fails. If you do this transaction, and as Laura mentioned, they move to New York or sued in New York and they don't honor our statute, then are you liable? to the extent that the transaction didn't work and protect them in the way that you had suggested they might. I think equally so, are, can you be sued by creditors in the states that don't have the asset protection statutes? I, I don't know the answer to that, but could you? Maybe. Maybe you personally could for creating this situation. I know that under the Connecticut law, they expressly say you can't be under our domestic asset protection law, but if they don't have that law, who's to say? Right. And even more of concern for us is what do we have to do as a trustee or as an advisor to before we go forward with this? Because if we have this knowingly standard, if we know everyone who's coming to us to do an asset protection trust is worried they're going to get sued for some reason or else they wouldn't do it. So what is that reason? And do they actually know that reason, that the issues out there or are they just getting ahead of it? Because if they know it's out there, we need to dig deep to find out whether they know that. Because that's part of our responsibility, is to do our due diligence to dig deep and say, are we committing some sort of fraud here? And as a trustee, if we take on that role, it's really important to remember who our clients are. Again, they are people that are intentionally trying to avoid creditors. That's why they're setting up these trusts. So the likelihood is that you will be sued as trustee of that trust. So if you want to go through that, because that is not gonna be a fun process to have to be sued in that context, you need to take that into account in the fees you're gonna charge, in whether you're willing to take on that headache, all of those things are, are to be considered. Because while this is a great opportunity for us to act as trustee, it may not be worth the fee. And it may not work. It, we, we're anticipating that we're gonna have clients who say, oh great, you guys are in Connecticut and we want you to act as trustee of my asset protection trust. I live in New York State, for instance. Do we want to take on out-of-state clients who don't have asset protection trust statutes of their own in their state of residence where they're likely to be sued? All of these things are things you need to consider when you look at this and say, ooh, yeah, new you know, source of income. It's not necessarily everything it's cracked up to be. So while we think it's a great new arrow in our quiver of asset protection planning options for our clients. It's definitely not something that we would call a go-to for the average client. It is something that's really a specialized circumstance, the right client, the right situation, the right set of facts. So thank you. As Meg mentioned, a lot of the claim requirements are pretty technical and not even necessarily things that you'd want or need to learn in order to set these up. But in case you are interested in seeing how they how those work and where the, your clients may or may not have particular issues if they know of a claim out there or they have a fear of a claim that might be coming, you can read through those and try and get a sense of what kind of protection there would be.